Okay, let's get started. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to our first conversation in our virtual event series, New Conversations. We're excited to welcome more than 400 of you today. Thank you for joining and supporting our tradeswomen community. Please take a moment, if you haven't already, to introduce yourself in the chat box. Include your name, title, company, and your relation to new. I've seen a lot of friends already chatting. Please keep an eye on the chat for updates and information, including information on how to donate to new and to support our students and graduates now and in the future. Be sure to share questions in our Q&A box and we will answer your questions throughout the panel or even after. As you may know, non-traditional employment for women or new prepares, trains and places women in the construction skills, trades and related industries. We are the pipeline of workers that build, move power, green and maintain New York. The COVID-19 pandemic impacts global society on all levels and new is no exception. Work has not stopped for our graduates working on essential construction projects, including hospitals and medical facilities and other expansion initiatives and new graduates are the essential workers both building and maintaining our city. Today, we are joined by industry leaders and supporters that are strong advocates for new. We're also incredibly thankful for our event sponsors today, our supporter sponsor, LF Driscoll and Structure Tone, and our three benefactor sponsors, FX Collaborative, Acom Tishman, and Lendlease. While we have so much to be thankful for today, and shortly we'll share a video of new graduate and plumber Alexandria, who is an essential worker. At the same time, we as a community have been deeply affected by the pandemic and by recent events. And we're talking about necessary changes, but also at this moment, we're talking about loss. And we as a community have suffered losses. Please join me in taking and sharing a moment of silence for our tradeswomen who we have lost due to COVID-19. Hi, my name is Alexandria DeFaria. I'm an apprentice plumber for Local One. I enrolled around 2016 and graduated around August 2016. We checked out carpentry and uh, we did a little electrical and we actually had to pick up a 65 pound bucket, which is very realistic because a lot of the times on the job, things are heavy and new really introduces you to how construction will actually be as opposed to just telling you about it you get hands-on training and experience my experience has been a little surreal uh after new you know everything just happened so quickly i started working construction definitely is something i would recommend women get into the most recent project i've been working on would be uh north central bronx hospital it wasn't like any other job i've had before working in the hospital alongside the nurses is rewarding um I see them and I always tell them, you know, thank you for what you're doing because I once had paramedics save my life because I have asthma. So I know how important the healthcare field is. And just to be a part of that is, is something I can't really explain. It's, it's above me. And um, I'm just grateful that I was chosen to even work alongside these heroes. Dealing with COVID, it's just like, you got to take it one day at a time and just 
take your vitamins, which is what I've been doing and, you know, just hope for the best. <laughs> Thank you so much to New for welcoming me with open arms. They were always very supportive and I'm very happy I went through that experience. I actually have a picture of my graduating class. <laughs> So that was a good time, and I will always remember all of you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. We're so proud of all of our graduates, like Alexandria, who are working during this crucial time. I'm excited to announce today that donations today will be matched up to $10,000 by a generous donation from a new board member. Please text hard hat to 44321 to make a donation by phone or look at the chat for links to how to make a donation. I'm joined today by a group of industry leaders to discuss continuing after the pause. If you have any questions for our panelists today, click the Q&A icon and enter your questions there. Our panelists today include Jay Badami, President, AECOM Tishman, and new board member. Patti Filippo, Executive Vice President, Turner Construction, and new board member. Ralph Esposito, President, Len Lease, and also new board member. Maureen Hennigan, President, nope, Chairman and CEO, Hennigan Construction, new board member. Mike Neary, President, Structure Tone, and Sanad Wadsworth, new graduate and council representative, New York City District Council of Carpenters. Thank you all for joining us today. My first question is open to all. On June 8th, phase one of New York City began with construction with it underway, how do we plan for this? What were the challenges? What were the new opportunities? And what were the successes? Jay, would you like to get started? It's on you. Yeah, I know, but I can't get it on. It's not coming on. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, how about, how about you start us off? Sure. So I, I think that we were we were incredibly pleased with um, our return to work this week. Um, the workers came back very conscientious, uh, very prepared, um, and I think as an industry, I couldn't be more proud of uh, the responsiveness. Um, the, the, the can-do attitude to restart our projects and, and really to make up the time and work safely and really kind of the uh, almost kind of the sympathetic approach that everybody came back with. You know, unlike things like September 11th or Superstorm Sandy, there is no insurance money to bail anybody out of this. And I think that as workers at America, I was watching downstairs. Shh, like I'm on the thing. We're all going to have to work really hard and be very conscientious. No, I can't resolve it. Yeah, achieving the things that we need to. Thank you, Ralph. So, Pat, I turn to you, Pat, in terms of how did you plan for coming back and what is, what's been happening thus far? Can you hear me? We can. You can't see me. I can't seem to get my, my screen up for some we reason. We cannot see you. It's okay. I look good today, by the way. <laughs> um, I put a suit, I put a tie on. Uh -huh. I even have a special guest here uh, from New, 
Dawn Stewart, who has been working uh, at Turner's headquarters doing the wipe downs for the, you know, the high touch areas. So Dawn is sitting on my left. She's been with Turner for two and a half years and she's a new graduate. So we're really happy to have her uh, observe this. So Dawn. And, and, you know, it's hard to say whether or not we're having new opportunities or successes because we're still trying to feel our way through what's happening here. But the one thing that um, is interesting, the industry really came together uh, much so uh, even sooner than this magic June 8th date that we're referring to. We've been sort of stalled since the early part of May because we were trying to get the pro these projects up and running and we just could not get them uh, started. We worked with Rebney, we worked with Labor. Uh, we were talking every night at 4 p.m. with the Cagney members, we met with the BCA members. And so we were sort of prepared well in advance, but stalled. And I have to say that that preparation has paid off and that, it, you know, there's a couple of bumps and bruises, but nothing that's really been difficult in terms of the startup. Plus there were jobs that were essential. And I think that gave us some practice. Um, the only opportunities that really took place, and I, I, it's kind of awful to say this, is that we were, um, we built a lot of beds. You know, many of us on the phone were part of building hospital beds uh, that thank God many of them weren't used. Right. Uh, so we did have an opportunity to uh, be a part of the solution, but I will say admittedly that being part of the solution also helped tremendously in keeping uh, the hardworking women and men who are part of the construction industry, the tradespersons working. Thank you, Pat. Sanad, I turn to you as both a tradeswoman and council representative for the Carpenters. How has phase one been for you? I'm sorry. So phase one has been a truly humble experience. Um, the New York City District Council of Carpenters takes pride in knowing that health and safety is our number one priority. So we actually implemented uh, a COVID-19 training that's done virtually. So they're training even though they're not physically at the school. And, you know, throughout the crisis, a lot of people lost jobs. They didn't have health. They didn't have the proper <coughs> means necessary going so being a union member really reinforces what we believe in and um i'm just grateful that the membership knows that we have their back you know um and a lot of people can't say that Others, others that would like to talk to this point. Jay, how is coming back been? Uh, look, I think we're back to work. I think uh, to echo what Pat said, the collaboration of Rebney, BCTC, uh, BCA groups uh, have worked tremendously with BTA to work with the governor and the mayor as part of the reopening. Uh, Dan Tishman's also on the mayor's committee for reopening the city. So mayor agrees, you got the governor back to the mayor. But uh, what's surprising to me is that uh, our job sites are up and running. We probably have 5,000 trades been working now. Uh, we were, uh, like Pat, we were probably 60% open in the past uh, couple months, and then the remaining 40% opened uh, this week. Uh, so the job sites are well prepared. Uh, I'm disappointed that our landlords, who are really not prepared, our landlords are waiting for the phase two uh, to do something, to mark elevators, and we've already been back to work. So I'm surprised that they have not been as forthright and proactive as, uh, as Ralph and, and Pat and, and the other CMs that are part of the organizations. I'm very, very kind of disappointed that they haven't got their act together and they're waiting for the phase two opening to really start that process. Interesting, interesting. Is this, some, is this something that others are experiencing? Maureen, perhaps? Um, 
It's it's a mixed bag. I mean, every every site is different. We were completely shut down. We had a few of our projects, which are all um, basically commercial interior and all located within the, the major, you know, commercial uh, buildings. Um, we found a mixed bag of some landlords um, being proactive and actually uh, willing to take on the screening and, and other things and others being sort of, you know, ambivalent and, and uh, not yet engaged. And um, so, but the, the process of shutting down, figuring out what we're supposed to do, you know, going through all of the motions that we went through for, you know, two months was, uh, you, you could not imagine that the people were very productive, but we weren't doing any of the things that make us productive as an industry. We weren't able to do most of our work. Uh, some of our jobs got essential permits um, just a few weeks ago and started up again. Um, but trying to understand the mixed messages of CDC and OSHA and the state and the city and, and the industry and and understand what it is exactly we need to put in place and how to communicate that to our people who just needed to know what, what do we do, you know, just how do we put this together? What are we supposed to, what are we supposed to do? And then procuring supplies of, of masks and, and hand sanitizer and all of those things and getting our own home office ready. Uh, it was a very, very busy, busy downtime. And um, we were finally, we were happy to shut down when we did because it was inappropriate for most of our jobs to remain open for the week or two that they did back then in March. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were very eager to get ready and we did take the time to really uh, prepare our sites well. Um, and there have been some hiccups this week. Um, you know, not all tradespeople were really willing to do everything they're supposed to do and understand the distancing and the face coverings and all of that. But for the most part, it's been um, pretty successful. We've already had some positive tests on our jobs. And, you know, so we're or thrown into that situation of, okay, okay now what do we do? Right. We thought we had a protocol, but every situation is different and every work group is different. And, every, you know, so it's, it, we're back in that sense of having to just figure it out each time and um, hope we're doing the right thing by all the workers and employees and, people in the building and, and most of all the families at home that everybody has to go home to and hopefully not, you know, transmit something horrible to them. So it's, it's been, a, been a, a ride. We're glad to be back, but it, it's, um, uh, it's still going to be a challenge. And, right. and we're back kind of slow right now. Some of our jobs yeah. have not yet started and some clients a little bit on hold they might be in a redesign phase or they're just not in a hurry to get their own people right back into it right. so um so you talk will still be a quite a learning curve yeah so it's a lot of change a lot of challenge um we all can relate to that i know everyone on this call um so how do um opening up to the panelists how do folks think what are the changes that will stick um, what are the changes um, that we're managing in terms of costs? Um, and what, you know, what are some thoughts about what the future will look like? Um, Jay, do you want to start us off with this one? Sure. So, look, we all have our clients who are looking for COVID discounts, whether it's from us, they're asking us to go back to the contractors that we have, that where we have executed agreements and asking for money to be given back. So. Uh, that's where owners, to some extent, some of them need it and some of them just can't help themselves and they need money back to do something else, but their revenue is certainly down on the real estate side. Uh, as far as, you know, we're looking at reductions from trade contractors now between five and to five to seven percent because they're more hungry and they see that work is drying up. Uh, condo markets are flat. Aviation, okay, but the Port Authority is out of money. MTA is out of money. So they're all pressured unless there's a federal stimulus package on infrastructure to get them to where they were before COVID. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people drying up. School construction, not announcing when they're going to reopen the SDC. So, you know, I think there's going to be some thinning of the herd just in, in a, some of our competition, not the people on the phone because their balance sheets are, are pretty 
pretty good, certainly all the panelists, but I think the next levels there are going to be certainly compressed uh, and they're going to be hard fought to really stay in business because they just can't obviously carry the load that if they release all their employees and they really have nothing you know we're nothing without our people we don't own equipment we have our people that's our only talent so uh, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future but i'm cautious we will never gain the revenue that we lost in 2020 our fiscal year ends uh, october 1st and we'll never recoup the 12 weeks of revenue uh, that we lost we just can't can't do it and as a publicly traded company you have to demonstrate double digit growth that's all wall street wants to know they don't care about the COVID. They care about how do you make money? How do you make your plan? And it's very difficult for us who are owned by public companies to do that. Mike, do you want to weigh in on this one as well? Yeah, you know, the, the, uh, the, the cost, you're talking about short term and long term, and obviously who's going to bear the costs. And, uh, you know, the way that we're looking at it is that it's ultimately affecting everybody right now, you know, whether it's the clients, the contractor, the subcontractor, suppliers. So, you know, we're really trying to keep uh, and evaluate the supply chain because, you know, it, there's impacts across the board. There are things that, you know, just from a, uh, we're trying to figure out productivity impact, which is a big cost for all of us in understanding um, in a competitive market. It's a lot more risk that gets taken and uh, we have to manage our subcontractors as they just went through a really, really rough time from a financial point of view. And, uh, you know, like I think Jay just mentioned, you know, the stronger contractors have a better position. You have a lot more risk out there and, and where all these costs, costs finally settle is going to be something that uh, we'll have to adapt to. Um, clients will be paying percentage of them and contractors across the board will be impacted as well. Yeah. Um, Maureen, I know you touched on this already. Were there other thoughts on this one? Uh, well, um, surprisingly, Jay, mentioned, you know, that clients were looking for discounts and we had not experienced that at all. We went through a whole process of putting together, you know, change order, dedicated expenses that really had to do with uh, responding to COVID and mitigating COVID. And um, most of our clients, you know, their private sector, you know, large tenants um, were fairly open to to receiving those costs and having to talk about it and, and covering some. Some were very generous about uh, providing costs to keep staff on the payroll so they didn't have to be, um, you know, furloughed during that time. So uh, we, we had a different experience with that and uh, it was surprisingly, um, uh, you know, cooperative and, and generous in recognizing the, the the worldwide, you know, yeah. um, cause of this, that it wasn't anything that had to do with our own actions. Uh, so, um, but there's still costs. There are costs that won't be absorbed. There are all the, all the, all the downtime costs and the productivity costs and the, and the, uh, just our own, you know, um, protocols to, uh, I guess, with the workplace. Um, so it's going to be a rough, it's going to be a rough year. Um, we're, you know, there were a month or two where we just we didn't have a thing to bill for. You know, we were just were not working. So it's going to take its toll. It's going to. I I my, I'm optimistic that we're getting back to work and we've found ways to kind of keep going, um, even when people get sick. But um, it's going to be a, a slow, slow. Um, catching up a time in the next year i would say yeah and yeah. And, the, and the bidding that we are doing is very very competitive yes very yeah, yeah. ralph is that something you're experiencing as well sure so I, you know i think there's two issues i think there's the ongoing work and we don't really know what the costs associated with production will be when we talk about hoist capacity and getting workers to their stations i don't think we really kind of fully understand the economics of that but I would agree with Jay and Maureen on new work that we're out in the market pricing. I think that we have to be mindful that condos aren't going to sell for as much as they did. Rents aren't going to be as high. Land values aren't going to as appraise as much as they did. And I think, you know, most of the clients that we have with jobs that were kind of uh, in development where we were about to start, there's kind of a rethink uh, about what costs have to come down by. 
Yeah. So there's there's two paths. Is it going to cost for more for a contractor to work in a COVID environment? Uh, and at the same time, with the lack of work, how much are they going to discount the margins? So you know, we're we're watching this very closely. We don't think that uh, the cost to operate in a COVID environment are going to be as significant as we thought, even though we got letters from everybody saying that there there would be. Um, but uh, I think that's kind of a wait and see. And you know, in, in reality, we've been open four days, and I think it's it's too soon to tell. So I'm going to turn to Mike um, and then Sanad and Pat in terms of turning to um, opportunities, right? We're talking also about opportunities. Um, so what are the opportunities beyond, you know, hospitals, um, building and expansion? What are, what do we think, um, what do we see in the future? Um, and we're also turning to what does that look like for tradeswomen and for the workforce and for labor? Mike, mm -hmm. I'll start with you. Okay. Well, you know, obviously out of, uh, it was already on a path, but I think uh, we've all had a lot of experience with uh, the remote remote working over the last couple of months. And, and if that doesn't indicate the amount of demand that there is on the, uh, in the technology sector, specifically, you know, all technology related um, uh, functions, data centers, et cetera, which may or may not be, you know, New York City centric, but obviously there's a large impact there. So you know, we look for that to continue to be even stronger than it was. We've already become a technology, you know, sector driven, uh, you know, uh, business and a lot of our businesses. So we think that obviously that's going to continue very strongly um, just with the kind of demand that's got put on the, on the system. We also think, you know, from a, a, the wellness and green initiatives being incorporated into designs, we think are, are going to be something that gets capitalized on. It's going to be a lot more important in addition to safety, just the wellness of all, all of our employees to try to get them uh, in good environments to come back to work. Um, people had great experiences, good experience or moderate experiences in working from home. So I think, you, you, you know, the, the office environment's got to adapt to, uh, you know, continue to attract them. Um, and I think, as we pointed out earlier, you know, aside, there's always going to be sectors that will, will uh, evolve from downtimes and have more of a demand. So we're all eagerly, eagerly uh, tracking those. But, you know, the biggest advantage for, you know, us and, and a lot of the, you know, panelists are going to be strong contractors in a market that is uh, very volatile and risky right now. So, you know, hopefully uh, there's a flight to uh, a flight to, to security and strength and, and we're all able to take advantage of that. And, and be there for our clients. Sanad, kind of along the same lines, what are the, you know, what are the opportunities in terms of, you know, infrastructure opportunities um, moving forward? What are the opportunities in terms of workforce and diversity? Um, and then, you know, Jim from the chat asked about, you know, what have, what have we, what have you seen? We'll ask others what they've seen in terms of, you know, what are those changes to job site coordination in this time and what'll continue? Um, so we've actually uh, had shops making um, partitions for job site. So we actually made them ourselves and they're going to be shipped to the job sites to be used to follow the safety protocols. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we've really been doing over the last couple of weeks is partnering with the community. Uh, we've, we've, we've partnered with Catholic charities to help give out produce and um, uh, supplies to neighborhoods that are in need. So I think that's a really, really good good thing because not only are we partnering with them, we're also giving out uh, news information and free apprenticeship information for the community because they don't have jobs right now. Um, the New York City District Council of Carpenters has purchased over 500,000 masks and supplies to help our contractors with uh, the shortage as well as members so they don't have to go out and um, purchase those things on their own if they don't have them already. And going forward, I think that um, this will make us stronger than ever because, you know, now we know what's possible. So knowing that we went through this crisis, we made it out on the other side, you know, thankfully some of us made it and some didn't, but for the most part, we know that um, we can get through this together. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Pat, before I turn to you, you'll be happy to know as new board chair um, that we are already 90% towards our matching $10,000 goal. So thank you all that are supporting us and with us here today. Um, so Pat, I turn to you in terms of what are the opportunities both for new and for the industry? Uh, what do we see as some of the ways forward? Um, before I answer that, I just, I, I wanna go back to something that um, Maureen also said that we, there are a lot of really good clients out there who really did support all of us through COVID, allowing us to have our, our workforce and the professional staff work from home, work remote, and we're uh, very uh, supportive of, of, of covering those costs as long as they could. It wasn't easy for them. But what, one of the things I think that, uh, if you want to call it an opportunity, was I think both clients and um, the industry demonstrated that there is productive work that can be done from home. So the idea that I only pay for staff that's on the job site, I think that concept is gonna be changed. And if, and if you accept that, you start to analyze what is absolutely necessary that has to sit in that trailer or that complex to build a project may now lead to smaller complexes Etc. So there are some opportunities that both the contractor and the owner will benefit from looking at how to execute the work differently going forward. But I want to thank our clients for that. The, um, the other uh, product type, in addition to um, certainly data centers and, you know, the Amazons and the Googles, you know, they, they've done well through this time frame, is also telehealth. I think we saw you know, many times I'd be talking to someone who said they went to a doctor's appointment by, you know, online. And that's, that's was relatively new. It's not that it was you know, the only way that it never happened before, but I think it's a lot more acceptable. And um, there, are, there are clients who are racing to market to expand on telehealth. So I think we're gonna see something different there. And of course, that'll uh, produce work. But then there's then there is the, this this next normal or you know they go back to my first point and and, and I, I I think I coined my own term it's called smart sizing I, I'm I'm fearful that the demand for space in the commercial of course will be less but not just not just health um, commercial it will be across the board everybody's going to evaluate their space needs going forward because we've all demonstrated what we can do working remote. And again, our clients will accept that as well. So we've all taken a shift, a pivot, if you may. And I don't think any of us have a crystal ball as to what that's gonna be. But if I were to speculate, if I were to speculate just by judgment of what I see in my own office today and what I expect it'll look like, we'll probably be up to about 70 to 75% occupancy from what we were before, meeting with the six foot distancing, uh, the social distancing, and um, and just the idea that we can have people rotate in and out and work in a different manner. So that's gonna to start to, to make everybody, at least in our operation, look differently at space, look at trailer space. You know, it, it, you're gonna see an adjustment. And uh, I don't think any of us really know exactly what it's gonna be, but I do know this much. Whatever it is that we're gonna build, the workforce, you know, we had a depleting workforce. It still was a depleting workforce. So going into the trade, working with your hands is still an honorable thing to do. Right. It's, I know it's what paid for my college education, and I know it's going to pay for a lot of other college educations to come for others. And um, I think as an industry, we'll be ready for whatever it is that they bring our way. Great. Thank you, Pat. Ralph, I'm going to turn to you next, but all of, you know, Pat touched on it um, as industry leaders. Um, you know, we've all been talking, I've been having a lot of conversations about how do we put people back to work after this time, um, in particularly people of color. Um, who new serves? How do we put people back to work? What are the opportunities there? Both what, what are the big infrastructure projects that we hope our, um, our leaders in government um, help us support and move forward? Um, and how do, we, how do we do that and how is new a part of that, which is something I work with all of you on this panel on. Um, Mike, I'll start with uh, you and then Ralph. 
I, I think I think news got a, a great opportunity with with uh, you know going forward, not just with the climate and if there's uh, you know more action and call to change, but you know into the corporate world. If you're if you're not plugged into the corporate world, it's a great avenue for new to make sure that they're building up the resources to be able to supply and work with the unions, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think that's probably not as tapped as maybe some of the, you know, governmental, you know, avenues that have been followed, but I, I think that's an area that probably made the doors may be a lot more open now. And I would be putting together a mission or a plan that really extends a lot of outreach there because I think the, uh, the opportunities are tremendous. Great, thank you. Ralph? So I think we would all recognize uh, and agree that the infrastructure in the region has some significant needs. And so fundamentally we have, as we always have, we have, we have more needs for capital than we have dollars available to properly maintain or replace our infrastructure. And the probability of failure increases on a daily basis with the longer that you don't maintain something. So I think the, the infrastructure uh, investment need to bro be broken down into both a short-term and a long-term strategy, right? So in the short term, I would say that there is a great opportunity for roads, bridges, and rail uh, where we can take advantage of these people who are really on the roads, and at the same time, they really lend themselves to the workers being to keep people six feet apart. And I think that kind of the beauty of the roads and all the civil work that comes out, it will all be union, right? And I think that creates a great opportunity for, uh, for the women of new uh, to get opportunities at a good playing wage. Uh, and I know that they have the support of the board members to help them advance. I think in the longer term, uh, investments about infrastructure need to focus on the improvements about health, around living conditions, and ultimately around protecting the region's economy. So I would look for investments in critical manufacturing to make sure that we have adequate food supplies uh, manufacturing to support the pharmaceutical industry so we can become less less dependent on, on overseas manufacturing and bring it back to the United States. Uh, I think that it's a great opportunity to look at projects around climate change that lead us from things like a storm Sandy. Uh, as Mike talked about technology, I think advancements in cellular, cellular capacity are going to be really important as everybody goes 5G and everybody, I have I have two boys and they're, they're always on their phone, so we're using our fair share at my house. Now more and, than ever, right? Yeah, and then you know, probably lastly, you know, investments in healthcare infrastructure to make sure that we have adequate testing facilities and appropriate triage units in the event that, that we have another pandemic. So I think that we would all agree that we kind of got caught short in terms of uh, preparedness. Uh, and I think, you know, we are inevitably going to have a slowdown in the private sector market. And I hope that the city and state take advantage of the balance of our industry um, and will we'll undoubtedly be a very competitive uh, pricing landscape um, to take advantage of doing things as, as a cost perspective as we can. Thank you. Thank you. So in addition to having a very strong new board, new also has a very strong ambassador council. Um, that program has been in existence for 10 years. Um, and as well as our signature projects program has been in existence for 10 years, um, celebrating both of those anniversaries. Um, you all on this panel um, have worked closely with me on the Students of Projects program, and members, a number of members from our Ambassador Council have been chatting and asking the questions around what are the opportunities around the Signature Projects program in this time. That is a program for audience members. That's a program where um, owners, developers, and um, construction managers set a goal for tradeswomen hours for life of a project, and then we work together with our partners in labor to monitor that goal and ensure that opportunities continue. The panelists um, here have worked with me and new on that in, in many different ways. Um, so the question is, what are the, what are the new opportunities for new there? Uh, Pat, I'll turn to you. You're muted. Uh, sorry. Thanks, Maureen. <laughs> new opportunities, how it, how new will play a role in the signature projects with where we're going forward. Yeah. I, I, I um, you know, signature projects program, it's, it, it's a great program. And, 
you know, those who subscribe to it and really are, are committed to it, the results are great. If, you, if you're not, then obviously uh, it, the results will show for themselves. I, I, I'm more in sync with the real equality of what's happening out there. You know, are we really committed I think that the recent events that we're seeing around the country have shown that we can't turn a blind eye to, any, to this any longer. And a commitment is a commitment and, and, a, and you need to have a defined approach to really driving home um, what is right. And, and if you look at the statistics of women in construction, it's just not where it ought to be. It's not what we talk about. It, we're working so hard, and yet the results are still not there. What are we saying? Three percent still when when we should be up at you know at least ten to fifteen percent. So, I think the signature projects is a, is a great um, great idea, but I think it's time to pivot again to really make these commitments and get and 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 really uh, pave the way for what is appropriate, and that's a real um, equal opportunity for women in the construction uh, trades. And on top of that, and I've said this, others have heard me say this, that work site has to be a safe place for everyone. And I think we have work to do there too. Others that want to comment on, I've worked with all of you on um, signature projects. Well, I, I agree with Pat that it's a great way to create demand, but it's not the only thing we can do. Um, there's there's um, so much we can do um, to really uh, get at the fundamental inequalities in our society and in our industry. Um, Thank you. I, I don't have a, a policy, uh, you know, <laughs> proposal for that, but it's, it's, uh, the signature projects is a way to create demand and it's a tip of the iceberg. Others on that? Um, myself and my colleagues, Samara Rivero, have also been working on a summit. Prior to the pandemic happening, we were scouting out MWBE and DBE companies to bring them in a room together also with new. We also, new is a part of it. Um, so basically um, getting women-owned companies and minority-owned companies in the same room and to bring about the mission and change we need. So that's still gonna continue. I'll give you guys a uh, definite date when we all get back to the new normal. Great, any others on this one? So I've got, I'm doing some Q&A. Uh, Salvina asks, can you elaborate on some of the job types that, types that can take place remotely? Ralph. Sure, I can. So, um, you know, we have been tracking this quite closely. Um, you know, as Pat said, you know, we always thought you had to be on the job site um, to, you know, make the, the appropriate contribution. And what we found is there are certain departments, uh, certain groups within an organization that are actively and been much more productive. Uh, so if you just think about it in the context of somebody that commutes maybe an hour and a half or two hours a day to get to work and then makes the same commute on the way home, you know, what we're seeing is people that their computers are going on at seven o'clock in the morning and they're staying on until, you know, six o'clock at night. So there are certain things in terms of finance, in terms of cost planning, in terms of uh, BIM, uh, in terms of some of the technology functions that we do that are actually much more productive. Um, and, you know, they've been successful at, at working remotely. I, I watched, you know, you know, my kids, um, you know, finish college, right, this past semester working remotely. And, you know, maybe they didn't get the college experience that they had wanted to uh, in terms of bars and parties, but, uh, you know, they were able to, you know, do their work, get it done, take tests, uh, and, and be productive. And, you know, we think from a quality of life perspective, uh, this is a very hard industry to work in. And I think to the extent that we can kind of soften uh, 
um, the, the methodology and the hours and give people an opportunity to be home more with their families, that's a very good thing. So, you know, I would say, I would it'd be easier to tell you who can't, right? And the people that can't are really the superintendents that are supervising the work and the site safety people. I think everybody else, my eyes have been open to the fact that they can work remotely. Right, and I've heard that from others too. And that's, that, that's a shift from where we were just a couple of months ago. Um, others that want to comment on this, how about you, Pat? Um, I echo what Ralph said. Yeah. Um, my eyes are open to it as well. And um, I think the future is going to be a better future for those who enter the construction work. It, it is a hard business. It, you know, I, I, I've been getting up every morning my whole life at 4.30 in the morning and getting home at 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. That's just the way it was. And the, I was sharing with my colleagues the the idea that I was able to connect with my family for the first time in my entire working life for a period of you know two and a half months, that was the biggest plus I've had in my life. The biggest negative was coming back to work and missing and going right back into the rat race again, right? But I don't think it's going to be a rat race. I think it's going to be a little bit different. I think the way we conduct business going forward is going to give you a breather. I've seen people... people I see people have more color in their, in their face because they're relaxed doing their work. They're not racing to meet at, uh, cross a bridge or a tunnel or get to a subway or whatever. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's a little bit more human. So I'm all for it. Yeah. Thank I, you. Ka Kathleen, I would, I would, I would add by, uh, you know, two things. One, um, you know, we, we all learned a lot about how successful it could be. And I think, you know, our first reaction is, I wouldn't want to do conference calls anymore when I can do a Zoom or a go-to meeting or Blue Jeans. We, we learned all these new platforms and webinars where there was more interaction. So I think, you know, that fact opened up a lot of our eyes where we normally wouldn't have meetings like that. So, so a big, big learning curve for, you know, managers or executives who, who were, were not as in tune. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there, there may be a big push right now to get everybody back just to, 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 you know, put our arms around everybody and get, you know, back right. to ground zero, get our feet underneath us. But I think going forward, we're going to be able to adapt a lot easier to manage people working from home, et cetera, just by the experience that we had. You know, we may want to get them all back now and whether it's 50 percent capacity because we haven't seen them in three months. But going forward, we'll have definitely different views of uh, how to manage. Thank you. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. I've got a couple more questions. Anyone else wanted to weigh in on that one? Let me just weigh in a little bit. I mean, our contracts right now say that clients will pay for our people if they're, if they're on site, right? So they, they've been very cooperative during the COVID. We've had 50-50 participation. Owners have been willing. I don't think on a long term they're going to say supers on site, project managers at home because they're never going to increase our fee because we don't get reimbursed for the people on site that our overhead increases, right? So uh, right now we're expecting all people who are working on job sites to come back to work. I think the bigger question has to do with the corporate offices, right? We've been able to survive without them. As a company, our real estate bill around the globe is $400 million. Our travel budget is $250 million. Those are the things that we're going to look at compressing, right? And I think Pat hit it on the we're all looking at a 25% reduction uh, in the real estate space. And our travel this year, where our budget was 250 million, we've spent 60 million. So that all drops to the bottom line. However, that hurts the airline industry, which means they can't expand. So it's a, it's a slippery slope wherever we go. Um, but so we're all in uncharted territory. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jay. As a reminder, um, you can text hard hat to 44321 to make a donation. Um, going now to a question from board member Ellen Albert. Um, she asks, do you anticipate any issues with deliveries from China? Will construction guidelines, protocols, stretch construction schedules, and if shift work, how will that be implemented and accepted by unions? So the shift work was accepted by most of the unions. We had a call this morning that there were a few holdouts uh, that are waiting and saying they're not going to do the shift work without a collective bargaining agreement. So it's counterintuitive uh, because the shift work was approved for 60 days with an option of 30 days. So 
I think that's still up in the air where we land on that. Uh, so that's one issue that's not resolved. And the after hour, after hour variances that we were all hoping for do not look like it's uh, taking place. So in order to work shift work, you want to have the continuity of AHVs. So it looks like, uh, you know, stranger things have happened and they will probably die a slow death just because we could not get our hands around it and solve the issue. Others on this question? My next question, Jay, is also um, stay with me. This is from Sherry Best on our Ambassador Council asking about the, the uh, opportunities at the airports. So the airports, uh, you know, I was going to mention that before. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Port Authority, we have to change the con There are opportunities at JFK for Terminal 1 and Terminal 6. Those are, those are massive projects. They're going to last five or six years. Uh, Certainly, there's people in my office who have been dealing with that on the uh, EEO and MBE part. There's huge penalties there for not making the M and W B E numbers, uh, which it, which is interesting. I sent an approval letter across, and Pat and Ralph can now I'm living in the world that they live, the Javits, where I was going to award 100% of a job to a W B E. It got rejected, and I said, "Why was it rejected? Why? Because the W B E did not include any M B E." And I'm like, now I'm really confused. So we need to have a better conversation about, uh, as opposed to penalties, we need to really make incentives for people and it's gotta really go to Albany. We can't have these large design build PPPs and Ralph and I were on a panel a few months ago. We said, we're putting too much out there in the industry. The industry cannot handle it, certainly with all the penalties. So we have to make it more of a, of a carrot as opposed to a stick, right? But as JFK, I mean, certainly you can call our people and Jim Durkin and Glenn Johnson are out there, so they'll, they'll deal with you on that. But yes, those opportunities are there. We're just waiting for the owners to get their financing in place. Yeah. Pat, did you want to say something? No, I, I, I the only thing was China. Um, we did a lot of checking and checking, and, and there hasn't been any um, abrupt stops that I can think of. Um, it, you know, they actually got back quite quite quickly to our surprise. You know, we have curtain wool coming from China on a specific job that I'm thinking of. So, look, you got to watch it like anything else. Uh, but so far, it really hasn't um, it hasn't really stood us up where where we can't complete our work. But then again, you know, we're, we're going to be going 100%. We've all been operating between like 30 and 50%, even if you were essential in the, in the modified essential. So. Um, this, is a, this is, I have a final question. Um, and before I do, I just want to thank all of you for your thoughtful questions. And um, just know that if your question wasn't um, chosen by our team for me to ask, um, it will be answered or if you can still reach out. This comes from Lauren Sugarman, um, our partner in Chicago, asking about how, you know, as we've seen in recessions um, past, um, communities of color, tradeswomen didn't come back, um, didn't um, reap the benefits in the way that New and others um, would have liked to have seen, and we're working very hard to make sure that, how are, that things are different. Her question is, what ways do you see your leadership and companies being proactive to ensure that this doesn't happen again and that we lose the progress we're just, we have been just beginning to make, as you all know, in your work with you? Maureen. Um. I'd like to make this a real big picture answer. We're at an incredible moment in time now. We've had this bug take, take not just people down, took the world down. We've had um, uh, shocking signs of um, just horrific uh, actions on the part of public officials against citizens of this country. Um, we know there's this deep-seated virus of racism and we know we're seeing once again and again and again the heartbreak and havoc that it causes. It, it's, not, it, it, it's not healthy, it's not right, it's not who we should be. 
we're at a we're at a place where we're already this we we took this pause and we're pivoting and we're we're uh, switching gears and we're pausing and we're thinking and we're now we're redesigning our workplaces and um, they're going to be different. We've talked about that. We're also redesigning, for instance, our police departments. They they have to be different. They have to serve all of us better as as a as a society. Um, and maybe it's time to rethink, as Jay was saying, you know, maybe we're approaching MWBE and uh, workforce diversity wrong in our industry. Um, it's always bothered me that the MWBE programs are all always about them, us versus them. That's not how it is. It's, it's businesses that just deserve the same opportunity as all businesses deserve. And when it comes to the workforce, it's people people who deserve to be trained and work, all of us. I, I don't care if you're purple or yellow with green polka dots, it, we all deserve the same opportunities. And at the same time, we have um, historic and sy systemic um, us versus them attitudes. And I just think it's time for us to redesign our own industry and how we approach opportunity and equality. Um, it, it's, it's a, it is a virus, it's a, it's a nasty disease um, that, that makes any of us think that we are us and they are them. And so um, that's a, a very big picture answer, but I, I would love to see us start somewhere and um, create, uh, pro I, I don't know if it's programs, programs don't always do it, you know, they become this yeah. political prescribed thing. Um, but somehow, change the culture and and get into a more uh proactive and inclusive environment and uh, we can all soar we yes can. and we can all soar i'm seeing a lot of right on maureen's in the chat um <laughs> and I, and, uh, if i was chatting i'd be one of them um i know i for one could have this conversation with you all for a lot longer unfortunately we are wrapping up here um so one thing I want to announce is that we've exceeded our match goal. Uh, we've raised a total of 17085 making our grand total 27085 So thank you all for that. I appreciate that. Um, to help support new and future trades we make. Um, I also um, want to thank our sponsors um, and let you know that next time we already have our first sponsor, and it is Hennigan Construction. Um, so we thank you all for your sponsorship. Um, it's been a pleasure. And before you go, um, please let us know which topics you'd like to see for future new conversations. Um, we're going to share a brief poll. So thank you all and be well.